What if a single pair of spores could launch an entire mushroom empire from anywhere, whenever you want? Today, I'll show you four foolproof methods using sterile swabs, spore prints, syringes, even dried fruits to capture and store spores with maximum viability. Stick around because later I'll share a tip that could slash contamination by up to 90%. What's up, Mushroom Fam? It's Gary with Freshman the Farm Fungi. Today, I'll show you four full foolproof methods using sterile swabs, spore prints, syringes, and even dried fruits to capture and store spores with maximum viability. Before we get started, check out our Etsy shop, Fresh Fungi, for over 30 different strains that we ship worldwide. Today, I'm gonna talk about spores and how to store spores over the long term. So there's a few different techniques out there and it can be challenging to decide which one to use, but each one has pros and cons for its own certain situations. The first kind of spore storage vessel that I'm gonna talk about is a spore swab. So why would you choose a spore swab over the other options? So the main reason is that it's very easy to carry and it's very simple to perform. You can purchase a spore or a swab kits like this one that come with a sterile swab and a glass tube, or you can also purchase cotton tipped swabs like this one that come in a sterile pouch. Both of them will work well. And I guess another main advantage of using spore swabs is that you can do it in real time on the fly. So if you're out in the woods or you're collecting some spores in the wild, you can really easily hold them in your pocket and then pull out a sterile swab and grab some spores off of the mushroom gills. It's great for low yield surfaces and crevices as well. So if there's a mushroom in a hard to reach place, it's very easy to get a, a swab and arrange it in a way that you can collect spores. The gold standard way to store a spore swab is to preserve it in a glass tube. So a common way to do this is to flame the end of the tube. So you would take a, a Bunsen burner or a lighter and you flame the end so that the, the airflow is out and it won't collect any contaminants. And then you would take your swab and place it inside the tube and then seal it for later. This is a very sure way to store those spores until that tube is opened up. By flaming the tube, it creates a vacuum. So that also helps the spores store well for a very long time. One of the drawbacks of using a spore swab is that it's going to have a limited volume. So your collection is limited to the surface area and a swab has relatively small surface area as opposed to a glass slide or a spore print, which is gonna be able to collect all of the spores from that mushroom. Another limited aspect is that since you're touching the fruiting body itself, then the chances of collecting a contaminant along with that spore is relatively higher. So swabs, unless they're taken in a sterile environment, like if you collect it from a, a mushroom that's grown in vitro in a bag or in a really clean grow room, the likelihood of collecting contaminants along with that spore is probably higher than if you would do it another method. Okay, so that brings us to spore prints. So spore prints are a function of collecting spores from the mushroom when it deploys the spores like it would in the wild. So when a, a mushroom matures and the 
the hydronic pressures on the gills reach a certain level, it will diffuse a spore out into the environment. So in nature, this happens when the mushroom matures in the wild and maybe after a rainstorm, when there's particularly high humidity, it will force the, that mushroom to release spores into the wild. So in order to leverage this natural phenomenon, you can take a mushroom cap and carefully place it on a surface. A common surface you can use is a glass slide. So these are very convenient for storage and you can look at it under the microscope, which is helpful to identifying the spores. Um, also, it's very easy to scrape the spores off of a glass slide and transfer them into culture. Another surface that you can use is a piece of aluminum foil. So these come in rolls. They're often food grade or essentially sterile. So it's a really good surface to use. And um, in addition to be being clean, you can fold foil pretty easily. So you can make a pouch which protects that spore print for the long term. One thing that you want to consider when you're collecting spore prints is the time that your spores are dropping from the mushroom. Um, you can do what is called a spore flush. If you take the fruiting body and put it onto a surface for let's say two hours, you let that first wave of spores drop as a flush because it could potentially be carrying more contaminants than um, it would in subsequent flushes, if that makes sense. So yeah, you can take the, the fruiting body, place it on the surface, and in the first hour or two, it would be releasing off contaminants potentially. So then you can remove that surface and put the mushroom on another glass slide or another piece of foil, and that subsequent spore print is going to be a lot cleaner than the first one. So this is a way to kind of filter out contaminants that you can't necessarily do with a spore swab or with a spore syringe for that matter. Another material that I like to produce my spore prints on is a sterile Petri dish. Sometimes if I open up too many Petri dishes when I'm pouring a bunch of plates or if I have a, a plate that I cleaned out really well and never utilize, I'll use these to collect a spore print. So it's a, it's a good way to upcycle Petri dishes and it's an easy way to store a bunch of prints in a library. Also, it's a see-through so you can identify the spore print really easily as compared to uh, aluminum foil, which you know the coloring might be difficult to discern or a glass slide, which like a, just a thin surface, so it's not as protected unless you get um, like a slide case. Okay, so it's a Petri dish encases the spore print, allows you to add water, which is favorable to making a spore syringe. So that takes us to the next method of collecting spores, which is a spore syringe. You can do a spore syringe in a few different solutions. One solution is just sterile water. So the benefit of sterile water is that if you collect spores, they're not likely to germinate because there's no nutrients. So one issue with using sterile water is they, the spores will tend to clump. So there's a, a benefit and somewhat undesirable outcome using water. However, you can always uh, agitate your spore syringe or use uh, a surfactant to help separate spores in solution. Another solution you can use for your spore syringes is a buffered solution. So you can use a really low concentrated uh, buffered peptone water. This will help the spores store longer uh, and be, be more viable long term. The downside is that if there's any contaminants that those will likely flourish in a nutrient broth. So you want to make sure you have a really sterile spore syringe or a, a really sterile spore print 
if you're gonna use any nutrient broth to make a spore syringe. So another interesting way that you could potentially store spores or mushroom genetics is with a dried fruiting body. So even after mushrooms are completely dried, those spores will remain viable in the gills of the mushroom. So you can potentially store fruiting bodies of your favorite or desired mushroom. And then later on in time, you can either use a sterile scalpel or a swab to collect those spores and introduce them into culture. So this is a very easy way to collect spores in the wild. So if you don't have a swab on hand or any of the tools that you need on hand, you can just pick the mushroom and dry out that mushroom. So you're gonna want to use a dehydrator or an oven to bring it down to a cracker dry water content essentially. And then this will allow for the spores to go into a hibernation. The drawbacks of this is that the germination rate might not be as good as if you collected spores fresh. However, like I said, if you're in a, a dire situation where you don't have the proper tools, this is a good last resort method. If you've hung in here this long, one tip that is going to help increase your spores germination rate is to store them with a desiccant pack. Once spores are introduced water, they'll try their hardest to germinate. If you have a desiccant pack present and that spore never gets introduced water, then when you put it onto agar or when you put it into a solution, it will instantly germinate and the chances that it will contaminate will be much less because the likelihood of other contaminants being in that system are going to be less because it's so dry. So there's something called water activity level where spores can resist an extremely low water activity where contaminants like bacteria or other yeasts will desiccate at a low water activity. So you can almost bring the humidity content down to a certain level and sustain it that way so that all the contaminants will die off. And then as you bring that moisture content back, the mushroom spores will be so resilient that they will be able to germinate as opposed to the contaminants at question. So in conclusion, Make sure that you store your spores with a desiccant pack in a dry and dark area. Whether you choose to use spore swabs, spore prints, or spore syringes, make sure that they come from a sterile environment or a very reputable source at that. I hope you enjoyed that video on spore storage and collection. Go check out our Etsy shop, Fresh Fungi, if you're interested in cultures. Uh, we have over 30 vetted strains and we do ship globally. Thanks again. Until next time, much love.